All right. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. Everybody get notebooks, hopefully. They're on the table as you came in. Hopefully, every, everybody got one of these, every couple. Uh, we were doing one per couple just to make sure we had enough. It looks like we have plenty. So if you are a couple where you each need your own notebook, then you may go to the table and get a second notebook, okay? We are, we are good with numbers now. You know who you are. So you know who you are. Um, but nobody's going to get up now because they don't want us to know that, they, that, that, is, that that is who they are. But you are welcome to grab a second notebook now. So we are very excited that you're here, and we're excited to get started with this class. This has been a, a dream and a prayer to, that this has been building now for a couple of years that we have wanted to do this type of course where we speak into matters of the family, so marriage, parenting, some of the stresses and pitfalls that we experience in, in families, in, the, in that dynamic, those relationship dynamics, some of the things that our culture is, is just pushing in on, on the family and causing so much uh, stress and, and, and worry and things like that. So we, we've been wanting to do this to say, Scripture speaks to this. The gospel speaks to this. And we want to help provide practical tools and, and, give, and give helps for these things that we all face. We've also wanted to be able to do this because there's grandparents in the room tonight who, who you are in the culture that we live. There's probably a, a strong likelihood that you're helping your kids figure out how to navigate the culture that they find themselves in. Because Honestly, as parents, none of us are really equipped to deal with a lot of the things that we are facing in our world today, right? It looks nothing like the world that many of us grew up in. And so even as grandparents, you're probably sitting there at times thinking, how do I help my kids learn how to do these things? How do I help them recognize things that they need to be watching for? How do I offer wisdom? How do I help give them some biblical advice for these things. So this will be good for that as well. This is going to be a conversation where we're all going to be learning together. So we're very excited to be leading up to this point. So thank you guys uh, very much for being here. I know Pastor was incredibly excited about this opportunity. So thank you for, for being part of it. Yeah, I would just well, say as, as a church, we, we are excited to uh, offer resources that, that help the family to press into uh, a critical need, as Daniel said, the the rapid pace and change in our culture it leads it, it leaves us asking well, well it leaves us confused and not always able to put our finger clearly on the issues that are that are being raised and how the Bible speaks to that and so uh, we want this class to uh, to walk through uh, clarity from the Bible as well as as being practical in our helps. Uh, to be able to, we'll have a couple sessions where we have Q&A sessions uh, where you can ask questions. We want to make sure we, we are uh, scratching the itch that you have and to get those helps and resources to you. Uh, if, if you have questions that are additional above and beyond uh, the scope of what we have planned, to, Daniel's about to go through the scope of what we have planned, um, but uh, if you have additional questions, uh, or if when we get through the end of a topic and you're like, great intro, but I need more, one of the primary jobs that we have as a church is to resource you and to equip you and to get you godly information. And so we will, uh, we will help in any way we can uh, to get you those resources um, and to bring those along. So really excited to... Uh, for this semester and the way that God's going to use it uh, in, in your family and my family uh, and in the life of our church. Amen. That's right. One of those resources that is available to you, and it in, should be inside your notebook, there's a card. Hopefully some of them may have slipped out, but you should have got a card that talks about a resource called Right Now Media. If you got that card, hold it up. Awesome. We got most. If you if if your notebook is one of the ones that that card fell out of, see us before you leave. I will get you a card. This is a resource that we as a church are offering to you. You can have that free of charge. Uh, the church pays for that subscription, and that resource is full of of videos that speak to marriage. Uh, 
It speaks to parenting. There's all kinds of great Bible finances. studies there. Yeah. Finances. Finances, yes. Um, and and from, a, from, a, from a biblical perspective, it, it's an incredible resource. So it's something we want you to take advantage of and, and to utilize. And so we've given you the information. If you aren't already using it, that card will tell you how to, how to create an account and get, get started with even using that as, as a resource for, for you and your family. Yeah, if you don't know what Right Now Media is, is, it's a video library that you can access on your computers and you can project that to your TV, uh, done by world-class Christian teachers, okay? So please use that. Yeah, and it's on, it's on Apple TV, it's on Roku, it's, it's on, I think, Fire Stick as well. I think the app is on all of those, so you can just log in there and it, it's right there uh, as well. So great resource. So quickly, let's walk through just the scope of what we're going to cover this semester. So with the, in the beginning of your notebook there, you see the course overview. This week and next, we are laying a foundation that will be something we build on as we really dig into matters of the family. And so what we're talking about here is we want everybody to walk away with confidence after these first two weeks that says the gospel speaks to everything that I will encounter. Their scripture has answers and the gospel will address all of these things. And so there's hope and there, there is a resource that I have that more than is, is more than enough. And so we wanna lay that foundation at the beginning because this is gonna be the language that will pop up as we go through each and every week. So we wanna kinda of lay that vocabulary and, and lay that for you at the very beginning. So the first two weeks are really gonna be dealing with that specifically. And then we will begin there in week three, moving into specific topics and issues that we, we want to address. You'll notice, let me point this one out, on January 31st, this is a special night that is tied into our sermon series that we're going through right now called Outsiders. We are going to, on Sunday, January 28th, be talking about purity, we're going to be talking about the dangers of pornography, how to, how to be free from those addictions. So we're going to address that on Sunday morning. And then on that Wednesday night, the 31st, there is an organization based here in San Antonio called Be Broken. And they are, they are going to be here. We have about three people from that ministry who are going to be here with us on the 31st to talk about how we can deal with and even guard against sexual sin. So as parents, how do you how do you put up some safeguards in your family to protect them from what is so prevalent and and so easily available? If you know, if it's if this has been a struggle in your home and in your marriage, they're going to give some really helpful practical resources that say there is hope and you can be free from this and and there is there is healing in this and so it's going to be it's going to be an important night that we need to speak into as the church right we don't need to bury our head in the sand on this issue and so that night will specifically be dealing with that. There will be some time for Q&A, but it's gonna be very discreet and anonymous where you can actually just text questions that you might have. Um, and the panel that is gonna be with us will be able to help answer some of those questions. There'll be resources available. Um, and so that, that's gonna be a really important night. So that is on the 31st. If you have youth, um... Parents, it, it is your discretion, but you are encouraged if, uh, if they are of appropriate age for your youth to join us for that night uh, on the pornography discussion and, and those resources. Uh, it, children will still be going along, and, and youth will also have a, a separate track that night for the youth that aren't here. Uh, Generally, as a gauge, we're saying if your youth are in high school, uh, then it's appropriate for them to be here. All right. Uh, real quickly, because we're, we're going to be talking about uh, purity and pornography on the 28th uh, and here on Wednesday night, uh, I have been asked by uh, church members like, well, what do you mean when you're giving that warning that it's going to be PG-13 or whatever? That's in content and in vocabulary. Uh, certainly, we will not be uh, grotesque in any way or descriptive in any way. It's just vocabulary, and the focus of that evening is that topic. That's, that's what we mean by that, okay? 
So that's the 31st. And then after that, we will pivot for several weeks, starting the beginning of February, going through March, all the way, um, all the way till March 20th. You will notice all of those weeks center around marriage. And we are very blessed to have Rick and Sue Hugler helping lead those weeks and give, give direction. So we're very excited. If you were here on Sunday, uh, they did an incredible job helping us think through marriage uh, Sunday morning. So yes, thank them. I was so blessed to get to learn from them. And I want you to have more weeks to hear because you should have seen their notes and the things they wanted to say that they didn't get time to say. I had to just kind of pull the reins in on them on Sunday morning to keep us on time. But they are going to be here. They are going to lead a very interactive, discussion-heavy time where we, it'll be very practical helps for, for marriage. And it's just to really pour into marriages whether you've been married six months or 60 years, these are going to be principles that will be so helpful. And so really looking forward to these weeks. Let me point out that one of those weeks is Valentine's Day. Wins Valentine's falls on a Wednesday. Let me encourage you, don't skip out just because it's Valentine's Day. We're going to do some special fun things in here that night that guys... It'll be a good date all, night. All guys are off the hook. I mean, this is good. Tell you're investing in your marriage on Valentine's oh, Day. Man. Wait a uh, What a brilliant idea. See? It's, it's, it's perfect. Seven dollar dinners, and you are making a, an, 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 er, an eternal investment in your marriage. What could be a better way to spend Valentine's Day? Yeah. All right. Uh, and we're talking about conflict resolution and how to communicate. So, um, so it'll be perfect. So don't miss that night. Let me tell you that. Be here. It's going to be fun. It'll be memorable. We'll have a great time that night together. And that whole that whole month is uh, February and then even March is really going to focus in on marriage. We will take spring break off. So you see that there. There'll be one week in there in March that we will not meet. And then we will come back at the end of March and the 1st of April. We're going to have two weeks really just focusing on a couple of specific topics that cause stress and that can be pitfalls in life in general, whether you're married or single, have kids, don't have kids, whatever. But dealing with finances, dealing with money, what does the Bible have to say? What, does, what are principles that are helpful for me to where that doesn't become a stress in my life and in my family. And then we're gonna spend a week just talking about busyness and time management and how those things are pull at, at us and, and weigh us down and how we, can, how we can have good habits and practices that we build in to, to our lives in that area. And then to finish out our time together, the last weeks there, the last five weeks or so, we will be looking at issues relating to parenting. We're gonna talk about who am I as a parent? What in the world is my job before God as a parent? And who are these kids that God has given me? And what do I do with them? We're going to talk about how we protect our kids. Uh, that night will actually will be a panel. I'm gonna we're gonna bring in some people to help just speak to different issues with with our that we deal with, whether that's social media and technology to school. Uh, lots of different things. So that'll be a very interactive good night. Uh, we've got a special guest coming in, Randy Frazee, uh, who used to be on staff at Oak Hills, if I'm not mistaken, has written several books. Uh, just a very well-known pastor here in the San Antonio area. He's going to be with us on the uh, May 1st night talking about what the what is the greatest thing that as a parent I can give my kids. So you aren't going to want to miss that night. And then we'll have a wrap-up session to conclude things on May 8th. So that's where we're headed. So you've got all that in front of you. So it'll help you make sure that you prioritize the nights um, that you need to be here. They're recorded. They if you are happen, recorded. If you happen you miss to one. miss, they'll all be posted online. So we know schedules get busy and sometimes things pop up, but know that you have that resource. Yeah, we know spring and Bernie is... Can be can be crazy so with with activities so yes they will be recorded and, and posted each and every week the handouts will be available pdf form online so you could download those if you're not here to get them in person 
So trying to trying to make sure that you get this content and can even pass it along and share it with with family members that that aren't here or friends um, that that need to listen. Just send them the link, point them to to the website, and they can get these things. All right. Everybody feel good with where we're headed? Is that good for an overview? Just kind of let you know there's going to be times of discussion. It's not just going to be an hour plus of teaching the whole time. There's going to be times we, we kind of pitch it to the table that you're at and let you and give you some questions to have some discussion, some interaction, application time. So there'll be some of that. So be prepared to, to kind of talk a little bit. And um, we're not going to try to put you to sleep with an hour and hour plus of, of teaching the entire time. And we want them to get to know their table. Yeah, get to know the people at your table. There's, and hopefully your table has a very multi-generational feel where you've got some young couples and then you've got some more seasoned couples at your table. Uh, and we want you to, that is very intentional. We want you learning from each other. Uh, we, want, we want that wisdom to be at the table. Uh, we want there to be questions and conversations that happen. We want you to, maybe God will work it out where some of the people at your table, you you spend time with outside of Wednesday night. Maybe you say, hey, let's go grab a cup of coffee. Let's go to, let's go to lunch sometime. Um, those relationships are so important, that encouragement that comes from, from the body of Christ. So, be good stuff. Are we ready to jump into tonight? We said the next two weeks are all about laying a sure foundation. And so that is where we're going to start. And the reason we need to do that is because... Do you guys know that uh, you ever feel pressure in your in your life, in your job, in your marriage, as a parent? You ever feel like, you know, that song, right, under pressure? You ever feel that way? I mean, there's a whole vocabulary now, uh, the vocabulary of human deficit, that a couple of generations ago, really, you didn't hear these terms as much, but now... First and second graders use terms like stressed out, burned out, overwhelmed, depressed. We talk about low self-esteem. There is, because there is so much stress, there is so much pressure that we feel in our relationships, in our culture, there's a whole language now where that basically we recognize that we don't have the ability within ourselves to, to address these things. And that, that is something that we believe as we go through this, the gospel speaks to these things. Because I was listening to a pastor the other day, Alistair Begg, and he was talking about stress. And he said stress really comes from three basic places. The absence of settled values, the absence of stable hopes, and the absence of established beliefs. And I started thinking through that. I'm like, well, there's a lot more things that cause stress in my life than, than those three things. But as I really sat in, and pondered it a little bit more, it's like those buckets are actually, they're pretty good. They, they kind of, a lot of things do fit into those things that depending on what I value, it can cause stress in my life. If my values, if what gives me worth, if what, if what gives me identity and purpose, if that is not settled in my life, stress can result from that when I feel unsettled there. Hopes, if I've placed my hope in something that seems very unsure or uncertain, stress can arise. Same thing with, with my beliefs. What do I believe? What do I believe in? Does it let me down? Has it proven to not be able to bear up under the weight that I have, that I have placed in it? And so those three basic areas, we would say those are big buckets that we could say stress comes from. And as I thought through that, even preparing for tonight, the, the thought that occurred to me is the gospel actually answers all three of those things. And so as we're laying this foundation, that's part of what I hope happens tonight is we see that the truth of God's word, the truth of who he is and who we are in him actually helps all three of these areas to help that pressure that we feel from the world around us begin to feel like it's something that we can actually bear up under and it's not as overwhelming. It's not causing as much anxiety in our lives. One of the things we're going to say multiple times through the night is this right here, that the roots of our faith produce the fruit of our life. 
So when you look at your life, when you look at like what what what's the fruit? What you know? What are you bearing right now? Is it is it stress? Is it worry? Is it is it conflict? Is it is it feelings of being overwhelmed? What what is that fruit that you see uh, in in your life or around you? Many times you could look back and say, let's let's look at the root. What what is what is at the root of that? Because the fruit that we produce comes from a a root in our life. And so if the roots are good, right, it it means that the fruit that our lives are producing will be good. So I want us to spend a little bit of time thinking in Scripture about what that that looks like and how the the roots of our faith, which is the gospel, when when we are planted in that, how that can make a difference in the things that we that we that we deal with, the things that that our lives are then producing, our homes, our marriages, our parenting. So let's look at a passage of scripture, Pastor. Will you walk us through John chapter fourteen a little bit? Yeah. So here's here's a passage of scripture that that speaks. Let's build the context real quick. Uh, Jesus, this is his final night uh, before his crucifixion. Uh, he is hours away from being betrayed and arrested. And he's trying to communicate to his disciples that he is leaving. But because Jesus is so compassionate, right? He's not worried about himself. He spends this dialogue pressing into them, right? He's about to be, you know, arrested and crucified and beaten and all of that stuff, mocked, spit upon, all of that. Take, drink the cup of the wrath of God. But, but our Jesus is trying to to press into his disciples. And so he says, let your hearts not be troubled. Okay, they're in stress. They can't see past the end of their nose, right? They've been following Jesus, but he's about to, they, they cannot yet comprehend the death and resurrection. So, so they're thoroughly confused. All right, he's leaving, what's about to happen? And their stress and anxiety and pressure and confusion, all of that is beginning to rise. So what does Jesus say to them? Let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He immediately goes to the root and he says, listen, you want cure for anxiety and stress? And what's Listen, look at me. Believe in me. That's what Jesus says. When you put your belief in me, okay, that's going to ground you. We can address those, those things, they're good, but, but we have to lay this foundation. Look back to me. Believe in me. And then he goes on to say, and he starts to give them hope. Right? He says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. This is betrothal language. This is marriage language. In, in the ancient world, uh, you, you would be engaged in, in if, if the, the woman said yes, right, she was now uh, betrothed to you, and then you would go back to your father's house and build onto it. You didn't have your own land or your own house. You would build onto your father's house, and then you would come back for her in, in, in with that marriage ceremony. So here's what he says. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So this passage zeroes in on Jesus saying, look, you're stressed out, you're confused. Here's the hope I can give you that is above any other circumstance. Believe in me. You can trust me. And by the way, there's always hope in the future right? And so then you can comb through the promises of the Bible, that God is working all things out for your good. See, this is the foundation that we will see for overcoming stress and for handling difficult situations is the belief that God is with us, that he's working all things out for our good, that we we have promises in the future, and that he's going to guide us. And that if we stand on his values and walk with him, he'll take care of it. That's good. So from this passage, 
we are going to see the gospel at work from what we've seen. Jason's already pointed out the first one there. There's four questions you see at the bottom of page three that are going to ground. This is the foundation. We're going to hit two of these tonight, and the next week we're going to hit uh, questions three and four. But this helps shape our understanding of the gospel. If that needs to be the root that produces good fruit in our lives, good fruits in our, in our parenting, good fruits in our marriages, good fruits just in general in life, then we've got to be really grounded here. So what are some questions that should kind of give us some form here to, to, to build on? And the first two that we're going to cover tonight, who is God and what has God done? And then next week, we're going to look then more about our identity in the gospel. Who am I? in light of what God is, God's work, and then how should I live in light of who I am? So that, that's, where we're, that's where we're headed. I want us to look at those two, which actually John 14 speaks to that, where he says, believe in me. Well, who is this that we are to believe in? Who is God? And then the second part, Jesus says in that passage what he's doing. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm coming back to receive you to myself. That speaks to what he is doing. So those two questions, he says, these are at the very heart of how your hearts cannot be troubled. So as we look at these four questions, let's start with the first one, who is God? And so on page four here, I just gave you just a taste of some passages of Scripture that speak to the attributes and qualities and some characteristics of who God is. And so throughout the week, I would encourage you to go back and read all of these passages. Time's not going to let us go through them in depth tonight, but go back and read them. Take time to circle specific phrases that tell you something about who God is and then write down how knowing that helps you. How that, how that helps you understand him better or understand situations, put things in perspective better. So use these passages to meditate on through the week. I want to draw your attention for just a minute, just to show you the importance of this, to this passage in Romans that you see. Romans 1, verses 18 through 20 is what we've listed for you on this page right here. Look at what it says. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, what's he talking about there? He goes on to say, For what can be known about God, who is God? What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, and divine nature, there's a couple of characteristics of who God is. It says these things have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And so Paul is laying a foundation for us here to say, listen, our tendency as, as human beings, as sinful people, is to suppress the truth about who God is. It's clear like we can see it around us, but we tend to want to suppress it. If we were to read on in Romans chapter 1, it says it never stops with just suppressing the truth. It says the more we suppress the truth about who God is in our lives, we don't think about it, we don't meditate on it, we don't live in the reality of who God is. He, Paul goes on to say what our next step is, is to exchange the truth about God for a lie. And that is such an indictment on the world we find ourselves in, is it not? That we have suppressed the truth about who God is to the point now that we are willing to exchange that truth for a lie. And he goes on to say, and we have become fools, that we now worship the creation rather than the creator. And so why is it so important for us as we lay this foundation to be reminded and to clearly understand who God is, is because if we don't, the tendency is there for us to exchange that and believe a lie about him, to believe a lie about ourselves, to believe a lie about our spouse, to be, believe lies about our kids, uh, about what the future holds. We can, we can get caught up and, and end up on this slippery slope to where I mean, we just become fools. We, we don't know whether to turn right or left or, or what is right and what is wrong, right? We're kind of just a ship without, without a rudder. 
but it starts way back there at, are we suppressing the truth about, about who God is? So this is important for you to dig into God's word and understand how to answer that question of who God is. But there's there's a second question that we've got to answer. Well, in, in here in a second, we're, we're going to unpack a few of these attributes about who God is, and we're going to show you specifically the way that not believing that attribute leads to all sorts of everyday circumstances of, of how we parent and what happens in our marriage and what we chase after and, and all of those things, right? And so this foundation is fundamental. It's why it's the foundation. We have to go through this and we have to be reminded of it all the time because we exchange it. And our culture certainly exchanges the truth of God for a lie. And so we must be grounded. And we're going to do some of that hard work of, of seeing the way particular issues drive back down to, they're actually questions about what do you believe about God? Okay, so the second one we want to uh, reiterate tonight is that what has God done, right? What has God done in the sending of his son, in the salvation that he has accomplished for us on our behalf? Um, there's three passages here. I want to take you through uh, the third one on that page, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. All right, I'm going to have you get your pen ready because I want you to do a few things on here. <laughs> this is... Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this, and, and this is one of those very long run-on sentences that he wrote. Believe it or not, this is one sentence in the Greek. Now, my, my English professor ne never let me write like that, but this is one sentence with just a whole bunch of commas and, and build on, okay? But he starts this uh, sentence, and uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. I want you to put a box around every spiritual blessing. Because that's what this entire unfolding, this, that's what this entire sentence is about, okay? If you are a born-again believer, if you know Jesus Christ, you have every spiritual blessing, okay? It is yours. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he goes on to say six things that I want you to put a box around by what he means by every spiritual blessing. So in verse four, put a box around uh, he chose us. So verse four says, even as he chose us, put it around, he chose us. He's talking about from eternity past, okay? That he knew you, that he chose you in Christ, okay? In, uh, in verse five, put a box around for adoption, for adoption, He has made you his own, all right? So when the Bible says you are a son of God, you are a daughter of God, he's adopted you, okay? Uh, in verse seven, put a box around redemption, redemption, huh? Huh? No, I'll, we'll, we'll come back. The, uh, I'm, I'm naming the six. The next promise is in verse seven, redemption. Redemption is a word that means, uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's a technical term that means to purchase, to pay for purchase. And here it says he redeemed you with his blood. That means he purchased you. He paid for your sin. It, it, it also has the context of either in the ancient world of being a slave who owed a debt and that debt was paid and then their freedom was purchased or like a prisoner of war. Uh, you, you could purchase them back. It, it's a technical term. It means he purchased you with his blood. Okay, That's what redemption means. And and. That follows the forgiveness that follows. So he has purchased your forgiveness. In verse 9, put a box around that he has made known to us the mystery of his will. Made known to us the mystery of his will. Now, when I, when I memorize this, I, I say uh, the, that he has revealed to you his purposes. 
his plans and purposes. Okay, this means uh, I mean, it's, I I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends. You you can know and understand uh, the purposes of the will of God. You can be a part of the kingdom. The mystery has been revealed, and you're now on the team. You can use your life for kingdom purpose. Okay, He's revealed His will to you. Okay. Uh, in chapter, uh, sorry, verse 11, put a box around that you have obtained an inheritance. Obtained an inheritance. That is the hope that awaits you in heaven. Cannot be defiled, cannot be taken away. Your inheritance. And then finally, uh, in verse 13, Put a box around, sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit. He sealed you as his own for that final faithful day. You have the Holy Spirit of God. You've been born again. So put all this together, right? You are chosen from the foundation of the world. You're an adopted child of God. He knows you as his own. He has redeemed you by his blood so that you are forgiven. He has revealed to you his plans and purposes for the kingdom and for your life. He, uh, you have obtained an inheritance that cannot fade away, and, and you have, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what he means by every spiritual blessing. Okay, those six promises in there. Now, uh, if you go through and underline in him, in him, in him, uh, you can do that 10 times, in him. Sometimes the phrase changes to in the beloved, or uh, most of the time it's in him, or in Christ, okay? So every one of those promises are in Christ. There's this grandiose movement that you see in this passage where God the Father is the actor. He is the one doing the action, okay? So uh, never believe the, uh, 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 a, f- a false dichotomy or a lie that, well, Jesus loves you, but God the Father's always mad at you sort of deal, right? That, oh, we'll go to Jesus because he's the sympathetic one. And by the way, God, he's, he's holy, but he's angry all the time, all right? That is, that is not true. God the Father is the actor. Here's the one that does all the actions so that you have every spiritual blessing. And what he does is he places you in Christ. So all of these blessings are in Christ. 10 times you are told over and over, you have all of this because you are now in Christ. Okay, does that over and over again. And God the Father is the actor, but there is this, then there's this final movement in there um, where you can underline this if you comb through it, uh, and that is God the Father does the acting by putting you in Christ so that you have every spiritual blessing, but then there is to a purpose that gets repeated uh, at least four times in here, and that is to the purpose of exalting how awesome God is, that his grace is amazing, that it is lavished upon you to the praise of his glorious grace. In love, he predestined this to the praise of his glorious grace, the riches of his grace. He has lavished upon us so that he would be seen as amazing, as this overwhelming father that pours out blessing. He's given you every spiritual blessing so that you can see and you can know him, that this is the kind of God that he is. This passage is magnificent, right? All this movement in there, God's grace. You have everything in Christ Jesus, all of this, and he's done it so that you and I will erupt in praise because we will see and know how gracious our God is. Okay? That's the kind of God that he is. I get excited. Just a little bit. <laughs> That's good. So, but what does that have to do with, with what we're talking about? Those, that, those are great things to know. Those are great for e- e- eternity, right? Oh, I'm saved because of all of this stuff. 
But I want you to see before we leave here, now this has very practical implications for our everyday life. The truth about who God is and the truth about what God has done affects everything. The most minute details of our lives and our relationships. We could we could boil down what we just covered and what these passages cover a lot of different ways, but the way we gave you in your notebook that we're going to go with tonight is we could describe who God is and what God does with these four statements. God is great. You could say God does great things. God is glorious. God does glorious things. God is good. He does good things. God is gracious. He does gracious things. He shows grace in our lives. This is who he is. This is actually what he does. What he does is a direct result of who he is, his nature. And so we want you to spend a few minutes around your table here, and we'll, we'll stop you when we need to move on. But on the pages seven and eight, we've given you these four statements, and we want you just to have a simple discussion around your table of ways that either you personally or you've seen around you, ways that you've seen God's greatness You've seen God's glory at work. You've seen his goodness and you've seen his grace. We want you to just, just think about those things. If you want to use that space to write those down, but it's good to pause and think how we've seen these things about God, evidence of them around us. So this is your chance to get to know the people around your table a little bit with this conversation. So take a few minutes to work through those four those four statements and thinking through how you see those, and we'll, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes to, to keep going, okay? Talk at your tables. All right, I know I'm cutting you short on this, but that just means you'll have to, you'll have to set up times to talk about these further. We need, to, we need to keep moving to leave some time here at the end for some more discussion, so you can pick back up in a few minutes so these are good things for us to be reminded of, correct? That God is good, God is great, He's glorious, He's gracious. But remember what we said, that statement that the roots of our faith produce the fruit of our life? These are those roots we're talking about, who God is. But what happens when those roots aren't healthy? What happens when we forget that God is great, that He is glorious, that He is good, and that he is gracious. Uh, Pastor Jason and I were, were thinking through this, talking about this a little bit through the week. And so we're just, just to give some examples of just how, why this is so important practically, when we forget that God is great, one of the things that can be a direct result of that is that we become obsessed with having to be in control. How, how is that so? All right, it, do we have any control freaks in the house? <laughs> All right. We also have a so, lot of liars. In this <laughs> All right. I I know the scene I'm a, I'm about to describe is no one in here, but you guys are aware that our culture has become obsessed with protecting our children. Helicopter parents overprotective, we bubble wrap them in everything, and we, we do not allow them any inch of space, right? Obviously, in parenting, there, there's a balance, there's appropriate, of course, we protect in, in, uh, our kids, but our culture has gone overboard. One of the things we're going to talk about, we have made idols of our children to the detriment of our marriage. So this whole idea, right, of, of being so overprotective and so overbearing on our children, if you think about it, actually finds its root in, do you genuinely believe that God is great, that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that he reigns above it? Or are you allowing fear of the endless possibilities to overwhelm you. So yes, there's a balance in parenting, but you, you have to ask questions of the heart. Are you believing in the greatness of God and in his sovereignty? You could, you could apply that in your marriage too. Maybe your marriage has been characterized by a lot of struggles, 
over over a lot of years, and you've you've kind of given up on it. You're still there uh, under the same roof and at the same address, but in a lot of ways, you've you've kind of given up because you don't think there's any hope for it. That can also get back to that that same root. Do you really believe that God is great and that He that He has the ability to work in a relationship that maybe you think is far gone? And so that we can, when we take control, right, we, we start trying to say, well, God can't handle this, so I've got to handle this. And, and we make a mess of it when we, when we try to do that. But let's look at the next one, too. Just another example. When we forget that God is glorious, one of the things that can be an outcome of that is that we can become paralyzed by the fear, the fear of man. How is, how is that? So speak to that for a minute, Pastor. Yeah, think about where our approval comes from. I know as, as men, as providers, it is very easy for us to get uh, performance and achievement driven uh, in our jobs and to get all focused on climbing a ladder, making sure we, we tick off uh, boss's approval, everyone else's approval and achievement and achieving all of the things. Why? Well, honestly, for, for a countless number of reasons, it varies from person to person, but a lot of times it is an approval-driven uh, reason to be uh, obsessed with achieving and, and wanting to, to make sure you hit all these goals. Yeah, and we and we forget, man, we were created in the image of God, right? Our worth and our value comes from, from Him, and but we forget that. We forget the glory of God that spoke into nothing and created everything, and we forget what who He is. And instead, we get so focused on something so much smaller. We worry more about what man thinks than we do about who God is and what and what He thinks. And, and it can, it can lead to all kinds of, of problems. And one of the root ones is, is this fear, this crippling fear where we get consumed uh, with, with what other people think and finding our identity in other things. Quickly moving on, when we forget God is good, we're tempted to look to other things to find our satisfaction. Ever been guilty of that? Looking for needs, real needs, to be met, uh, but to, to, to meet them in, in, in counterfeit ways when God is the one who, who can provide them. We forget about the goodness of God. Yeah, when we talk uh, in a couple weeks about uh, sexual purity and the, the temptations of pornography and teaching this to your children, well, one of the root causes is, is God good? Because you have desires, and we're taught to control our desires and to keep those within boundaries. And, and Satan continually says, that God is a cosmic party pooper. He's holding out. He doesn't want you to have fun. And one of the root things that you have to believe to overcome temptation is God gives me rules because he's good, and they're actually for my good. And so I'm going to keep things within his boundaries because I believe that he wants to bless me through obedience. Those are some of the things that we got to pass along to our kids because the culture is going to say, you're, you're just a fuddy-duddy. Christians are boring, right? That's, that God's a cosmic party pooper, okay? But no, God is good. Yeah, we, we forget it, and we're so prone then to, um, to settle for cheap imitations, are we not? rather than, than the real thing of what he satisfies. We're losing our signal somehow here. I don't know how. All right, last one to look at then. When we forget that God is gracious, we can slip into attempts at works-based righteousness. What in the world do we mean by that? That's a mouthful. Yeah, works-based righteousness. An easy way to say that is, is uh, to become very prideful in your own works, right? Nicodemus was very good at being churchy, doing all the right things for performance driven, for exterior pleasure, for uh, self-exaltation. 
And Jesus attacked that repeatedly. He's like, you pray on the street corners because you want everyone to notice you. That's self-righteousness here, okay? But you forget that God is gracious, that he is a God that pours out forgiveness and grace. And just like when we got to the end of that uh, you have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So at the end of that, you would erupt and praise that God is gracious. That changes you, right? That affects you. It can't not affect you. So do, do we struggle with self-righteousness in, in marriage ever? Daniel, yeah, no, you and KK might. Never. No. <laughs> You know, the, the thing that I'm thinking about when we, when we think about this one here, we fool ourselves, right? We want to put on such a good facade that looks like we're righteous, that looks like we have it all together. So, because we want to fool ourselves that we don't need the grace of God. I think we buy into that lie sometimes. Deep down, we know we are in desperate need of God's grace and His mercy, but we do everything we can to convince the people around us that we don't need it, right? We work really hard to win and to achieve, um, to be right. Uh, you know, we got to be right at all costs because we, we, can't, we can't look like we're wrong at anything, and we forget, no, no. At our very core, we were sinful, fallen people. We are in desperate need of the grace of God in our lives. And when we don't recognize our need for grace, we're not very good at showing grace to others, are we? we people who don't know how much they stand in need of grace aren't good at, at showing that grace. And so those are, yeah, and, and in my marriage, yes, you're right, Jason. I, I never, I'm always quick to show grace to my wife. Never like the hugglers. Uh, that say, if you would show me just a little bit of grace that you show everybody else, that would be really nice. My wife has never said that to me. I actually made sure not to make eye contact with her on Sunday because I thought she's going to give me the, the raised eyebrow like, sound familiar, buddy? So, yes. So why do we go through this? Again, we want you to see this connection. So when you see control, this, this possessive control in your life, when you see the fear of man, when you see uh, materialism and, and being driven by pleasures that you know are not godly, and when you see self-righteousness, it the root cause is always to go back and drink deeply from the well of who God is. He is, he is different. It, 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 you can't correct these things on your own. It's only through drinking deeper from the gospel and realizing who God is. That permeates everything, okay? All right, so we want to close with just a little more discussion around your table. Now, if you've got young kids that need to be picked up in the kids' building, that's around 745, so maybe one parent will need to slip out if, if you're still having good discussion to make sure you know they don't send your kids home with puppies and uh, a bag of sugar. Uh, but other than that, take time around your table. On the last page, you will see four discussion questions. Pick any of those that you want to go through. If you're looking for, well, we can't get to all of them, which one should we do? I would say talk about number four, that how might things change in your life and in your relationships if you were to remember that God is great, glorious, good, and gracious? How might things look different in your marriage with your children, in your home, if you were to remind yourself of these things daily? That would be a great one to end on, but take some time to discuss Next week, when we come back, we will be looking at those second two questions that deal with our identity in Christ, who we are because of what we've looked at tonight, okay? Enjoy the discussion. Hope you're back next week. Invite somebody to join you, okay? Enjoy the discussion, and then when you're done, you're free to go.